Hey nutrition nerds, hope you're all doing okay. First things first, Happy New Year! 2020 was a bit of a weird one for all of us. Let's hope this year we can get back to a bit more racing and life to just be a bit more normal again. But about the topic of today's video, it's something which is so interesting and has so much potential because we all want to know how to get faster, right? The secret of training, the best way to get quicker. But is there any magic formula? Let's find out. So welcome back to another video, my nutrition nerds. I've split today's video into two parts, so we've got time to go over things properly. And I'll tell you what, I've been really looking forward to this video. I mentioned the topic that I'm going to be talking about today in the video I did on fasted training, which if you haven't watched yet, by the way, go and check it out because it gives you some background context to what we're gonna be talking about. Now let's just quickly jump on that and talk about the aim of this strategy. So we want to get better at using fat as a fuel source, right? And why? Because we've essentially got an unlimited amount of fat when it comes to exercise, but we've only got a limited amount of carbohydrates. And the problem is that as we work harder, we start to shift away from using fat as a fuel source and primarily use carbohydrates, or if we're working hard enough, we only use carbohydrates. So by improving our ability to use fat as a fuel source, we spare the amount of carbohydrates we use in exercise and hopefully can work harder for longer. Now, as we discussed in the fasted training video, the problem with traditional fasted training is that our muscle glycogen stores, and that's carbohydrate stored in the muscle cells, is relatively untouched, which is an issue when we want the improvements to take place in the muscle cells. So those clever scientists are trying to come up with ways to manipulate nutrition to get around that problem of having untouched muscle glycogen stores. And they've come up with another strategy, which is what this video is on. You'll hear it called different things, but I like train high, sleep low. All right, so what's the deal with this strategy and how might it help us? The first part is to have a training session where you work hard. And it's got to be a hard session because the aim is to deplete muscle glycogen. And we know that that happens when we work harder. For example, high intensity interval training. If this all sounds a bit alien, by the way, and you don't quite understand things, I've linked a video at the top of the screen, which you can watch for some more information on this concept. So anyway, we do high intensity training in the evening. And this might be something like repeated short sprints or something like eight by five minutes at something like 105 to 110% of your FTP. And we're totally knackered after and have used up a lot of our muscle glycogen stores. We then only consume protein and fat in our subsequent meals. So no carbohydrates, and then we go to sleep, which is where the sleep low part of it comes from. That means sleep low in terms of carbohydrate stores. And in the morning, we train fasted, and this morning session is a low intensity, easy session, lasting somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes. The aim is to make our body get better at using fat as a fuel source because we're low on carbohydrates. And it should induce changes in our cells which help with this. For example, we might start producing more of a certain enzyme which helps our ability to use fat as a fuel source. And then we go back to a normal diet, making sure that we eat plenty of carbohydrates. And that's the really special part of this training. We periodize carbohydrates. This means at specific times, reducing them for a specific reason. And at other times, making sure that we eat lots of carbohydrates to make sure that our high intensity sessions are well fueled by carbs. So what does the research say about this strategy? We're going to go through some of the studies that have looked at periodizing carbohydrates in this fashion. The first study to cover is by a group of researchers led by Marquet, Marquette, Marquette, Market, Marquette. And I'm sorry if I've just butchered your name. But anyway, she's a clever lady and along with her colleagues, designed a study around this train high, sleep low method. They took 21 triathletes and after a three week period of baseline testing and familiarization, split them randomly into two groups. 
one who would follow a periodized carbohydrate approach and the other who would just follow a standard high carbohydrate diet for endurance athletes as a control group. They then had another three week block of training, which was where the intervention period happened and they all performed the same training. As part of it, they performed some high intensity training in the evening, followed by a low intensity session in the morning. The periodized group restricted their carbohydrates after the high intensity training and the control group just had a normal amount of carbohydrates as they would. After the three week training and diet intervention period, they then performed the same baseline tests. And the two specific ones that they wanted to look at were a supramaximal cycling test to exhaustion, which aimed to last roughly 60 seconds, and a 10K time trial run after a 40 minute cycle at roughly 90% of their FTP. So what were their findings? Now, by the way, when I talk about this and I say significant, that means statistically significant. So when the numbers are crunched, they show statistical difference between them. In research papers, you might find that a value goes up or down over the course of the study. But when the numbers are crunched, it's not shown to be statistically significant. And while that value moving up or down might show a trend and be important, if it isn't statistically significant, there's a much lower likelihood that that value is a true difference. Right, anyway, so what were the findings? In the supramaximal bike test, compared to the first time they did it, the control group didn't improve. The sleep low periodized carbohydrate group, they improved by 12.5%. 12.5%. That's impressive on its own. But how about the 10K run? Again, the control group showed no significant improvement. The sleep low group, however, improved by 3%. Now to put that into perspective and give some numbers, the average runtime for that group at the start was 40 minutes and 23 seconds. And at the end of the three week intervention group, it was 39 minutes and 10 seconds. Now that is pretty incredible. Over a three week period, already pretty decent runners managed to improve their 10K runtime by over a minute and over 12% in a supramaximal power bike test. Honestly, I find that staggering. So those performance tests seem pretty incredible, but are there any other important findings that they reported? And the answer is yes, there's more. So one of them was body composition. Over the three week period, they found that the sleep low periodized group reduced their body weight by just over a kilogram with the majority of the weight loss being fat mass. The control group didn't have any change to their body weight or composition. They also found some changes on perceived exertion, basically how hard they felt the exercise was. The sleep low group found that the morning low intensity sessions were significantly harder, which isn't surprising. But when it came to that final submaximal test before the 10K run, they found that it was significantly easier compared to no difference in the control group. And this does suggest that they improved their fitness and found the same testing easier, which also makes sense. Now the researchers did consider whether there was a placebo element to it. We know that the mind is a powerful tool and it can influence our performance. The researchers purposefully withheld the aim of the study from the participants because obviously they couldn't blind the participants to what they were eating. So maybe they felt they're on some sort of super performance diet and that accounted for the changes. But realistically, did it? Maybe, but I don't think it improved the 10K runtime by over a minute in three weeks. So this study does seem to show some crazy improvements in triathletes who are already pretty good. Based on that, it would seem that this is something that we should recommend to everyone and that everyone should do to improve their performance. And we could make massive improvements. But is it as simple as that? Well, you're going to have to wait till the next video. I'm sorry, but I think we should leave it there. There was a lot of info in that video and I don't want to overload you. The next video will be out in the next week and it's going to be a good one. If you haven't already, then make sure you press the subscribe button and click the notifications icon to make sure you stay up to date with when I release it. And I'd love to know what you think so far, so let me know in the comments if you've ever done training like this or think it might be a good idea. 
And if you haven't already, then give the video a like. I'd really appreciate it. And I'll catch you next time. See ya.